Hello, everyone. Um, I want you to look around you, look at your clothes, look at your books, look at your shoes, look at your handbags, and think of where all that material came from. When you eat chocolate, do you think that you're only able to eat that chocolate in India because an Adivasi woman somewhere was collecting sal seeds, which makes the oil that uh, goes into substituting for coca butter. When you look at your handbags, do you think of tannin that converts hides into leather, the drugs that you take when you're sick, BD leaves, I don't know how many of you smoke BDs, uh, but everything, almost everything that we, you know, look around, paper of course, tables, books, um, doors, windows, of course this was before everything became prefabricated, chemical, but so much of our sense of who we are, the stage that I'm standing on has wood, comes because of the forest. Right? And who brings that to us? It's doesn't come into the market of its own. It comes because there are people who know how to get this stuff out of the forest, people who s spend their days collecting it, uh, finding the honey, finding the right kind of medicinal plant and bringing it to us. But where is this knowledge? Uh, what is happening to it? What are we doing about it? How do we make it part of our education? That's something I think that we really, all of us, need to think about. When you, for instance, see somebody um, at a traffic light, um, when you see a construction worker at a you know, building site next door, have you ever thought that this is somebody who could actually be one of the last few speakers of an endangered language? That this person that you see carrying bricks is somebody who might actually know the names of 400 plants. You know, more, if I've lived in Delhi all my life, I can barely identify 10 trees in Delhi. But I was asking some children in Bastar how many plants that they, you know, how many plants they could name. And they reeled off 100 names, uh, you know, without any problem, different kinds of leaves, different kinds of plants, different uses. And one Ved in, uh, East Godavari district told me that he knew the names of 400 plants and different uses for them. So what's happening to that kind of knowledge? Um, we talk about, we're constantly told that Adivasis um, are, need to be civilized. If you look at all the government policy documents, they're all about how people need to be mainstreamed. Now you would have heard this word constantly uh, we need to mainstream our population, we need to give them skills, we need to educate them. Um, especially when we're talking about, um, you know, what education means. We really have to think that we cannot have education, we cannot have something like TEDx, we cannot have technology innovation without diversity. And because grey matters, because grey matters not just in the heads of students in DTU but, uh, in the, or in Delhi University, but because grey matters wherever it can be found. We need to recognize that our greatest strength in India is really diversity. Okay? And when we talk about mainstreaming, what are we thinking of? That everyone should speak English? That everyone should go to a mosque, church, gurdwara, temple? Uh, that everyone should wear designer clothes? You know, what when the main when our own mainstream the mainstream of india is the most incredible diverse place that we can ever imagine then to sort of want to restrict it to a few dominant languages a few dominant religions a few dominant uh, cultures or ways of wearing is actually forcing us to lose much more than we have uh, gained in terms of knowledge so just to give you one little idea of, I mean, a few examples of the kind of diversity that we have in India. The People of India project, which is something that was conducted by the Anthropological Survey, um, found that there were 4,693 communities in India. The Census of India 2011 found 
122 languages that were spoken by more than by communities of more than 10,000 speakers. Of which, of these 122 languages, only 22 are official languages. But there are many languages which are not official languages, but which are spoken by millions of speakers. So for instance, Gondi, which is one of the dominant Adivasi languages, it's spoken by 2.7 million speakers, is not a scheduled language. Kuruk, again spoken by 1.7 million speakers, Mundari spoken by 1 million speakers, all of these are languages with rich histories, with rich knowledge, but they are not part of our official schedules. The people of India, uh, the linguistics, People's Linguistic Survey of India found that there were 780 languages in India and a small state like Arunachal has 90 languages. Nowadays, when we think of Arunachal, we, thinking of, we, you know, we think of the assembly and all the kind of uh, changes that you know, went on there. But we don't think of how much, you know, when we talk about politics in this country, all we talk about is the same old political parties. We don't talk about the fact that, you know, here is a state with 90 languages, that even Gujarat has 48 different languages. So you think of Gujarat as a homogenous state with one language, Gujarati. But actually, there are many, many people who may speak Gujarati and their own other languages. There are 66 scripts in India. The National Knowledge Commission um, found that there were 4,502 different types of agricultural practices. When we think of rice, there are 70,000 rice varieties in India. Even if you think of what you're cooking on an everyday basis, on a random basis, if you count all the different kinds of spices, vegetables, etc., that you would use, and you know, again, our cooking these days is very restricted. And if you think of all the recipes that your grandmothers knew, um, people use on average at least 150 different types of fruits and 150 different types of vegetables. So we have this incredible, incredible diversity in the country, which is something that we don't seem to care about, something that we don't seem to preserve, and we are allowing it to disappear at a rate that is faster than the rate of knowledge that we are acquiring. Now, what are the factors that lead to the destruction of all of this indigenous knowledge? One is, especially when it comes to Adivasis, this whole tendency to look down on them, to think that these are people who are uncivilized. I've seen bus conductors in places like Bastar kicking, out, kicking off old Adivasi men and women off the streets. Now imagine off the seats, making, asking them to make way for some young official type who has a greater right to that bus seat. Imagine if that happened to your grandmother, how would you feel? There is, the government of India had put on, had created an official tourism website for Bastar, which said, the Gons do not drink water like normal human beings. They put their mouths down to the stream like cattle. They have pro-fertility mentality. They are always drunk. Uh, they drunk and carouse in a drunken mood and have sex and all the time. Now, this is the way that the gov if the government is beginning to think about its own people in this kind of way, then what hope is there that the government is actually going to value their knowledge, treat them as anything more than labor. The second big problem is displacement. Now, as I said first, the first um, problem is the kind of cultural denigration of Adivasis, the fact that historically across the world, whenever the government has or invading settler colonies like in the US or Australia, they wanted to take over their land. One of the easiest ways of justifying use, uh, using savage methods against indigenous people is to call them savages so that you don't have to feel bad about your own savagery. The second big problem is um, displacement. Now, there have been three major waves of displacement in the last 200 years uh, that have completely 
change the lives of millions and millions of people in this country, changed the way our environment looks, changed our ability to access knowledge. Now, the first big wave was forest cultivation. If you look at the photo on the left, that's a normal, biodiverse, uh, natural forest. And this is the kind of forest that the forest department historically have wanted to replace them with. Plantations which have one species, single row, because they're easier to produce um, timber from these kinds of forests, mass-produced forests. So what have we lost? We've lost this huge biodiversity, this knowledge of different types of plants, different types of species, and we've gained the knowledge of how to cut trees on a commercial basis. Between, um, 19, between the 17th century and the mid 20th century, about 13.5 million square kilometers of forest were lost due to railways, due to cultivation, due to population growth, to industrialization. The second big phase of displacement in India has been large dams. And a study done by Walter Fernandez estimated, and this is a serious underestimation, that between 1950 and 2000, uh, about 60 million people had been displaced due to large projects. And 40% of them were Adivasis, which means, given that the Adivasi population is about 8.6%, that one in every four Adivasi have been displaced, sometimes more than once. Sometimes the same village will have been displaced because of a large dam. They move into a forest area, then that forest becomes a national park, then they're displaced again, and finally they end up in the slums of Delhi. And the third major phase of displacement since the early part of this century is mining. And as you can see very clearly, the areas of mining of forest overlap very clearly with the areas of Adivasi populations and uh, they are being widely displaced for that. The other big problem is when we talk of formal schooling, of course everyone should be literate, everyone should be educated. We want that for ourselves, we want that for Adivasis, we want that for Dalits, we want that for minorities. But we also have to be careful that schooling doesn't mean that people are made to feel inferior. That they're told that if they don't speak one of the dominant languages, follow one of the dominant religions, that somehow they are culturally inferior, that when they begin to speak the dominant language, somehow they will become much more civilized. And that's a huge problem given how much knowledge we lose when we lose particular languages. The Inuits, for example, have 22 different words for white, simply because all they see around them is snow. So when you see so many different varieties of snow, there are this gray snow, white snow, pure white snow, and it means something that those different words exist for those different types of practices. Villagers in Rajasthan have different, Anupam Mishra talks about how they have different words for different types of raindrops. Fat raindrops have a different name, thin raindrops have a different name. And when we lose these words, we lose the idea, the knowledge that there are these different types of raindrops, different types of snows, different types of trees, different types of plants. We're always being told that people need to be modern, they need to leave the forests, come and live in urban areas, that they will be skilled, they will be employed. But we're really talking about only skill employment for about 10%, which is the formal sector. And in doing that, we are forgetting the remaining 90% of our informal sector, which is really what is going to drive our economic growth. The National Knowledge Commission estimated that creatively tapping this informal sector knowledge could actually lead to 100 million persons being employed every year and 60,000 crores annually uh, in terms of revenue. So it, it's not just about citizenship, it's about good business sense, it's about good economics, it's about preserving our knowledge, that we should learn to look around, to look at the knowledge that people have, instead of constantly looking down and thinking that we're somewhere up here. Thank you. <laughs>